Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure being here. It's my first time. I've been to all of those countries and never to Finland. So this is my first time and it's such a pleasure being here. I've seen a lot of speakers, I've been to a lot of conferences and I've just tweeted this. I don't say this lightly, but the young panelists I saw here and the content that you covered, Jonas, it was some of the best thinking that I have heard in any of the conferences that I've been to. I was so enthusiastically taking notes and tweeting and Instagram storying everything. Um, I'm genuinely impressed and excited by the level of thinking that was expressed by the panelists. So um, I, that, that's fantastic. So um, only what I will say will echo some of what's already been said, but it just means that we're, our thinking is similar. So that's a great thing. Um, I came two days ago via Lebanon. I was speaking at a CSR conference there. I flew back the day before yesterday and went to the UK where I live and then came back. I almost didn't get on the flight at Lebanon and I was thinking about getting the next flight, which would mean I would come directly from Lebanon to here. So I almost came in my summer dresses, sandals and, you know, no coats. So this is only a good thing that I made the flight and now have some coats and scarves with me. So I'm going to be talking about really how to change the world, but I'm going to be covering a couple of aspects of that um, that we can perhaps develop later in dialogue, and I'm happy to take any questions. In fact, I'm dying to hear any questions or comments and thinking that you have to, um, to open that dialogue. So first of all, um, Inspiring Age International, we exist, as said, in over 100 different countries. We create human potential for social impact. We believe that creating change, this changing world and this big thing that we all talk about, really comes from each individual understanding. And I know we've been talking about you know, individual versus um, you know, um, kind of strategic development, and it, it's all absolutely important, but they're interlinked. But we start with developing individuals who then have that larger impact. So just some of the things that I've been fortunate enough to do, you know, here we're training young people in the Bahamas on how to use natural resources like shells that are so ready, uh, readily available to them to set up social enterprises, here we're helping to transform the education system and how young people are engaged in the classroom in the UAE. Here we're working with um, a climate change initiative, taking young people, this is in East Asia and Indonesia, to be able to take their project to the United Nations. I'm so excited about hearing about the work you're doing, Hannah. So, you know, a real mixture of creating change through people. That's what we're kind of there to do. So... I made this statement because I had to kind of almost explain my position, but I'm a feminine woman in business. I'm an ex-asylum seeker who started in my sector when I was just 13 years old. You could say I was that term, disadvantaged, but I resent that label. I think your mindset is everything. If you see no obstacle, that'll become your reality. And people said, you know, Melody, that's so naive. And I don't think it's naive, I think it's being proactive. If I believed everything the world told me I couldn't do, then I would have never got out, the, out of bed. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a woman, I was a refugee, I'm an immigrant in England, I, you know, all these things. So. You know, I think, I think your mindset is everything and learning how to control that begins, magical be things begin to happen. So I was born in Iran. I uh, actually lived and grew up in Sweden. So I'm not from very far away from here. So the first thing I did when we landed was go and buy lactis because there is no good quality licorice in England. So that's the first thing I did and I've been eating liquor all as I've, all the speakers have been talking because that's very exciting. So that's what I did. But at the age of 13, I became co-founder of UK Youth Parliament, one of the world's most um, successful democratic youth organizations. That's why I really, uh, you know, connected to all of the speakers on stage because they're all connected to something within my own story. Um, and I did that. And we managed to change laws and policies that affected young people across the United Kingdom. But really, everything that we've done has been centered around this. Doing well by doing good. We want you to be successful. We want you to make money. There's nothing wrong with people wanting to succeed on an individual level or as an organization or whatever. But if you can do that whilst also having some social impact, actually giving a shit about something other than just yourself, this is where you know, we are really trying to encourage broader thinking. So 
You know, um, Eric Shivin, who's a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, he said this about Inspiring Gage International, um, you know, which, which really made me quite nervous, thinking, wow, we really are doing something serious. And that's really what we aim to do. So I want to say a quick frog story. Has, has anyone heard the frog story? Okay, so I'm going to give you a scenario, and I'm going to ask you a real question, okay? So lots of frogs at the bottom of the bucket. They're all like... How are we ever going to get out? It's just way too high. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Okay, we need to think of a plan. Okay, we're never going to get out of here. It's just way too high. What are we going to do? We're never going to have One little frog from the bucket, bottom of the bucket was able to leap up and jump out of the bucket. How was he able to do that? I know you know this, Paulina. Yeah, climbing on other people to get ahead is not exactly the moral of the story that I'm leaving you with. But yeah, I get what you're saying, helping people to get up. I'm looking for another answer. There's lots of right answers, really. The will, the will definitely. What else? Yes? Trying definitely trying, yes. Yes? Pardon? Yeah, that's good as well. Yeah, that, that's good. Actually, that's half right, so I'm going to give you half a point there. The answer is the little frog was deaf. There's always going to be people in life who try and define reality for you. They try and give you something like it's fact. Nothing is really fact. It's all about perception. So sometimes in life, and this has been a big driver in my journey, you have to be a deaf frog. You've got to know what you want to do, and you've got to seek advice. There's nothing wrong with seeking advice, networking, going to people, thinking. Nothing wrong with that. That's great. But... When you know what you got to do, you just got to go and do it. There will be people who tell you, that's impossible, it's crazy. What? No, don't waste time doing that. Lots of things. It might be out of love. Your mom will tell you because she wants you to have a steady income. You know, that's crazy. Could you please just get a proper job? You know, or it might be haters. You know, many various reasons. But sometimes in life, you just got to be a deaf frog. So... There was a study done at Harvard University that found that something is 80% more likely to happen, that's great odds, 80% more likely to happen if you simply write it down. So right now, I want each person in this room, if you have access to a phone or a paper or something, just do this with me. Write one sentence of something that you want. Simple. What do you want? So write on your phone or on a piece of paper, whatever you want, just one simple sentence. Nobody has to share this. This is just for you. Write one sentence of what you want. It can be very big. It can be small. Whatever you want. Just take a second and just write that. And while you do that, the question, what do you want, is one of the hardest things, actually. Achieving it actually isn't. It comes second to actually choosing and really deciding what you want. And the reason it's 80% more likely to happen is only because you've decided. You've decided what you want. And that's a very important process in, in creating change. Because it starts with you, and you've got to know what you want, and you've got to know what you're doing. And it can be a personal thing. You might have written something very personal. You might have written something professional. It doesn't matter. But it starts the process of thinking on the inside. So I have in my office a wall of, I write it on an A4 piece of paper with a black marker in capital letters of the things that we want to achieve, things I want to do on a personal level. And I only take them down until I've achieved it. So I have another folder of the things I wrote that I achieved. So it's a great technique and thing that we should be doing to create conscious minds. You and us already said this. The world is changing. Things are happening, and I loved what you said. Change has been constant for people your age. You're absolutely right. So, you know, world's largest taxi company owns no vehicles. Most popular media owner creates no content. Facebook, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And the largest accommodation provider, it owns no real estate. Maybe just 20 years ago even, 10 years ago, people would have said, that's impossible. What kind of a model would have come? 
This is the sharing economy. Sharing economy is actually closely related to what we're doing in terms of social enterprise. But it's the mindset shift. Again, we're going to the individual element of it. It's the mindset shift in people that is causing organizational change, which is why the, both of your points are so interconnected and complementary. So let's look at this. We are moving away from profit. It isn't just about your bottom line in currency. What kind of profit are you making? But also your success is measured by your impact. Now, what kind of purpose have you got? That's also an indicator for success. We're not just now looking at hierarchy. You know, Yunus, again, you talked about flipping the whole leadership model. Yeah, it is moving away from hierarchies to networks. You know, that's the network model is what causing the Uber successes. You know, it's based on a network model. We're moving away from control. Again, what you said about empowering people. How can we, as a leadership model, start to begin mobilizing these changes and empower people to do that and empowering is one of those soft words that what does it really mean and you do need uh, you know models and ways in which you can engage with people that makes it more meaningful moving away from planning we used to sit you know years ago we used to sit for ages planning how to do things how are we going to do things and most planning and then a little bit of doing and now it's moving very quickly from idea to experimentation and then from privacy to transparency we are living in a social media transparent sharing world there is nothing wrong with sharing, oversharing a little bit of what we're going to do so people can connect. These are all, by the way, interconnected points. So social enterprises when going to work is your good deed of the day. You know, this is the real inspiring age thinking. So, you know, we are now living in what I call hashtag the social era. You know, this is the social era. It is actually a very, very exciting time. We are also uh, really in need as well, not just exciting and good th things to do, but we have very many uh, problems actually facing us that can be solved through a model of what? A business model that makes money, but does so with a social mission at the heart of it and how that's structured. And then all or some of those profits are invested back into the social mission. Um, what I can see from Finland is that this region has always generally been extremely socially conscious, uh, particularly compared to a lot of different countries in the world. Um, but I think that there are so many um, accidental social entrepreneurs, maybe social entrepreneurs who don't even know that what they're doing is could be a social enterprise. And I think that that's the thing, is that we don't have a struggle here, trying to, like a lot of countries I speak at, to struggle to sell the concept. I don't think it's the concept that we're selling. It's more about the model of how they could run a successful and sustainable business that also has a social impact. Um, so just a couple of examples, you know, so uh, Daniel, the young person that kind of, you know, we, we were aware of and we worked with, he started running. Very simple, he wanted a running club in London. And basically what he did was, he just uh, started charging like a couple of pounds for people to join this running club. And it really simple, people were out of trouble seeing the sights of London, doing something good, but Nike heard about it. This is the flagship store of Nike in Oxford Circus in London. They heard about it, they sponsored it. Really simple concept, simple thing. Making money, doing something good, having a huge social impact. This is Anna Evans, you know, she was 13 when she started, you know, the upcycling business that she was running, Once Loved Shoes, it's called. She simply, you know, who here has spare shoes? I mean, you know, sending them to landfill. And instead of sending them to landfill, she upcycles them. She fixes them up. She sells it. She also does art classes. People come, you know, to a tent at an exhibition. They bring their old shoes, their old things. They sit and they learn about how you can upcycle product, add value to product. You know, again, making money, doing something amazing, and she's still in education. You know, so this is just some of the things that, you know, we could be doing. But social enterprise sector has come a very, very long way. In 2011, 75,000 people in England applied to be on The Apprentice. So I applied to be on the show. I made history being the first social entrepreneur, even till this day, to ever make it onto the program. And literally the scariest thing I've ever done. And um, when I came onto the show, the producer said to me, Melody, look, when you come on the screen on TV, your name comes up and a title every time you're on the screen. So what do you want your title to be? And I said, because you can't have a company name, you've got to have like, you know, so John blah, 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 car salesman. You can't have the name of the company, yeah? So I said, Melody Hosseini, social entrepreneur. He, said, he laughed and he said, Melody, 
you can't have that. And I was like, why can't I have that? And he says, Melody, they're going to think you're an entrepreneur who likes to go out a lot or that you're on Facebook a lot, so we can't have that. And I'm like, this is crazy. So this is how far we have come since 2011 where people thought social enterprise was entrepreneurs who like to go out a lot versus, you know, so entrepreneurs in, who have a social impact. So, you know, that's the really great thing. So... You know, we are in search of impact, whether you're, s we, it's not just social entrepreneurs. Can I ask here, who's a social entrepreneur here? Okay, a few, few people. Who here is employed working for a company or, or, you, or some kind of government, or you, you work for someone, but you have a social impact interest, you know? Okay, cool. So, this is what I mean. This isn't just people who are social entrepreneurs. You don't have to become a social entrepreneur in order to have social impact. We are now seeing, you know, these um, kind of studies that are done by Deloitte are showing that people stay employed, they, they stay working for you if they feel connected to the purpose of your company. You know, if people begin feeling disconnected, they leave, basically. You know, people leave uh, th th through lack of feeling of purpose, what you were talking about, you know, feeling like you're part of something and that you have a purpose. So that's very important. But the skills are important. You know, Hannah, you mentioned about skills, you know, and going forward. So, you know, the top... We have very good interpreters, by the way. I understood everything you said. So the 10 skills you need to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution are as follows, and these are very important things. We are going into this new fourth industrial revolution, and there are 10 skills that the World Economic Forum have said are absolutely crucial for you to be successful and thriving. And these are just some of them. So, you know, first you've got complex problem solving. I'm not going to go through them, but you can see, you can see the, uh, the real theme here. These are all skills that a robot basically wouldn't be able to do. That is what we need. In your offices right now, look around your teams. Any jobs that, are, that basically could be replaced by a robot to do uh, are, are at risk and that's less valuable to the company than anyone with emotional intelligence, for example. These are things that we need. You know, you know, uh, you, you know we talked about how at the moment we need mental capacity to be built, not just physical problems to be solved. And this is why, you know, these are the things that are now valued. So this is important for us to develop that. Now, you know, I really come as I was listening to, you know, um, the structural and, and you know, um, versus the individual, I thought to myself, that's such a good point. Because, you know, really, we believe in you, if you build individuals who feel good in here and in here, and they understand who they are. Because purpose is one of those words, like you, you need to have purpose, yes. But really, identity is important. Identity, purpose, personal motivation, these are all very interconnected things. We do something called My Passport, okay? So simple. You just take a blank piece of paper, and on it, this, is, this isn't just basic things for young people to do. This is f actually for everybody should do this every few years. You've got to think about who you are. So you think about your passion. You know, what is that thing you would do for free on a Sunday with a smile on your face? What would you do? What really gets you going? What gets you excited? You know, your greatest strength, your ultimate goal, your motto in life, or even your defining moment. What was that moment for you where everything changed? You know, like you told that story about that conversation with the girl. You know, what is that moment that you had that changed everything? And you know, if you define these things, then less people will feel lost. You know, people talk about, you know, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what I'm doing. That's because we're caught in this wave of the world telling us entrepreneurship is very sexy, university is very sexy, this is everyone should be doing X, Y, Z. Well, you know, as the world keeps changing, you got to stay, you know, clear on who you are and what you're about and where your position in the world is and what your asset is so that you know how to create value. And that's the thing that I think, you know, um, that where it starts with. So this difference between success and failure. We've worked with young people at primary school level, developed entrepreneurs there through school, university. We've worked with businesses such as Facebook, KPMG Philips, HSBC Bank. Seeing the progression of people, the difference we've seen between people who are successful and people who may not um, fulfill their potential is simply people who are successful, they just show up to things. It all starts with just saying yes and showing up to things, and they put in. They put in. You know, they speak out and they put in. And when you put in, it doesn't matter where you come from, you get out. The people we've seen who may not fulfill their potential are the people who do this a lot. 
oh, I can't be bothered, you know? It's that whole thing, you know, oh, can't, you just can't. And we get a lot of that, see a lot of that in the UK, unfortunately, through the schooling system. And th people lose their kind of that drive. And we start thinking, like, whose responsibility is my future? You know, is it governments? Is it, you know? So it's that. The difference between success and failure is feeling personally responsible and simply showing up and putting in. And, you know, um, to young people that we're all working with here or young people who are here, use your time wisely when you're time rich. When you're young and you're not working, you're not necessarily rolling in the thousands and millions, but you have another asset. That's time. That's something I have very little of these days. You're time rich when you're young. Use it very wisely to invest into something that is volunteering, giving something back, and you're building. That's what I did for 11 years. So... Okay, I want everybody to uh, do this exercise with me, okay? So I want you to look around the room and memorize everything that you know that is red. Okay, I'm going to test your, test your memory, okay? So look around the room, memorize everything that's red. You've got three seconds. Everything from shoes, coats, trip, everything. One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Close your eyes, everybody close your eyes, okay? Now tell me everything that was green. <laughs> Exit light. You see, your exit light is always green. Open your eyes. So that doesn't count. Now, here's the thing, okay? We, our minds, no matter how intelligent we are, like, Matty, you're, you're a very individual thinker. You know, you like to be different. I think you are an innovative thinker. That comes across from you. Now, no matter how much of an innovative thinker we are, we are all programmed to think a certain way. People like Matty less so, actually, I think. You, you, you seem extremely of an innovative thinker. But we are all still products of our environment. Now, the thing is, when we think about creating change, we have to break that a little bit. You've got to just break the status quo and you know, how we program to think and question things in a good way. Begin dialogue, question, wait, it's always been like that. People say it's always been like that. It doesn't always have to be like that. And we're getting used to things changing. I mean, the world is forcing us now to question even our politics and even the UK being part of the EU is no longer even as something that we can really rely on. But, you know, this is the thing. We all have to always question everything. So when I say you think of the red, sometimes in life we only see a certain thing, the red. But we have to open our eyes a little bit. Now, going back to what you wrote a couple of minutes ago about what you wanted, I now want you to write one more thing underneath it. One way you can make it happen. Think of what you wrote and just write underneath it one thing you can do to make that thing happen. Just write one thing, a hundred things, just one step you can take to make that thing you wrote a couple of minutes ago happen. How can you get closer to it? Sometimes our big goals can seem so big that when we sit down and we plan for it, it's almost difficult to approach it. But if you've written without barriers what you really want and you just write one thing to get closer to that, that can be easier. So this is something you can obviously develop later. You can write lots of different goals, but definitely do think about it and take that home with you. Now, this is the thing. This is the formula, okay? When you think about how to change the world, the world is such a big place. It's so, it's so many things you could do. Where do you start? If you're a change maker by nature already and you've been doing this for a really long time, that's one thing. You're already kind of on that path. You know what you're doing. But if you're somebody who has real um, passion, you want to create change, but you just don't know how, you don't know where the model is, you don't know where to start, you don't know what to do, then, you know... This is the thing, get involved, have conversations, but really, you don't have to be the end all and you know, solution to that problem. You can just do small actions. But if you get lots of people involved, you'd mobilize people to get engaged, then it can you know, create really big results. And social media is a great way to do that. Now, you know, if you are a social entrepreneur with no budget, social media and being very savvy about your message online and being consistent can create real competition between you and major corporates who are now online trying to get that following. So this is a great way to kind of do that. Now, you know, I think for me, 
the main kind of message is how can we help people to build real understanding of who they are and their personal brand and connect that then to their personal mission. And I think that really, in a world that's constantly lost in so many messages, is a real starting element of doing that. Thank you. So, I'd be happy to take any questions or points. There's lots of different things that I wanted to um, kind of build on and talk about, but I wanted to kind of give a little bit of um, a few feelers and then hear what uh, questions and thoughts that you may have. Or it might be something that you're working on. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Thank you for that question. And I'm, uh, by the way, it's really good to hear this issue have already been mentioned a couple of times because I think it's such an important um, crisis that we really need to be very conscious of and feel part of, actually, as opposed to someone else's problem. So thank you for that. Um, I don't think there's anything I necessarily could say because I think that... It depends on the situation, it depends which country they're in, it depends what, you know, what's happening. But I think generally, um, I'm saddened greatly by um, you know, the, the way that this issue is being dealt with and how people are perceived, certainly in the UK from a personal perspective anyway, I've been really disappointed with what I've been hearing. If I were to speak to young people who are now refugees, and I do at some point have had engagements with young refugees and, and uh, immigrants generally, um, I would say um, it's hard. Uh, it's really, really, really difficult. I think what I would say is stay focused on what you can bring to society. I think, I think every single person who actually comes to a new country does try to give back. I mean, even from my own background, I came to the UK, I couldn't even speak English very well, and I started you know, being involved in community and giving something back, and then all these years I've worked in the parliament, I had a meeting with Tony Blair about the war in Iraq, I, I even sat on the committee for votes at 16, and then I didn't get to vote in Brexit because I was a Swedish citizen and I didn't get to vote. I mean, it's just, you know, so I... I really empathize and do not want to say, I would tell them it's oh, going to be okay, it's going to this and because it's very, very difficult times right now. But this is more to do with the process of how, Im how refugees' crisis is being dealt with and whether their applications are being upset. From the On a very personal level, I would just say stay sane, stay focused, and try and find. There are many, many people out there and organizations such as yourselves doing incredible work to help people. And find those initiatives if you can and, and get the help, any help. There are people in communities, very small NGOs, small social enterprises, organizations, people in human humanity who are willing to help and try and get to those places and if there's any support available make the best use of them and stay sane and start developing your skills and your mindset and don't lose that and once you get an opportunity then, then start utilizing that and give something back you know but it's but it's very very difficult times yeah oh good okay so Good question. Always turn the, que the questions I ask you to me. I get you. That's a good strategy. So a few years ago, you, you said your story. Mine is a, a little bit similar. So I was doing this project for Barclays Bank, right? They told me to go and speak to homeless young people on getting their stories and experience and how we could help them improve the financial system and bank accounts for homeless young people, okay? So that was the brief. So I worked with Centerpoint UK, which are this uh, incredible charity that help homeless young people. So I walk into the room, and it was like, has anyone watched Freedom Writers? You no? Know, you have? Yeah, amazing film. Anyway, so I walk in, it's a bit like Freedom Writers. It's like craziness. One person is having a fight, one person is on the phone, one person is shouting, everyone is doing something crazy. And if you're wondering why would they even be there at this seminar, this you know, consultation, it was because they were getting a £20 voucher that, to be there. So anyway, I walk in and I like thought, this is just, we're not going to do anything. So I said, listen guys, I'm not even going to pretend that I understand what you're going through. I cannot possibly, but I promise you this, if you guys work with me, 
I will personally capture everything that you've said to take it to the people who can create change. Maybe not for you, but for the people who come after you who are in your situation. I promise you that. And all of a sudden, they were putting their hands up, saying Miss Melody and you know, being so polite. And basically, what followed from there were each person sharing their incredible story. Because there are reasons why young people in a, in a developed part of the world become homeless. So this one young person, you know, she was, he was saying that he came home from school, opened the door, walked in on his father, basically murdering his mother, went through that, he became homeless. So really, really sad stories. Got to this one young person, Ashley, his name was. He was the most, um, uh, being the, you know, the most troublemaker in the group at the start. And he got to him. He was like, look, I'm not even going to lie to you. I carry a knife. I have no food to eat. When it gets to a certain stage, well, if I have nothing, I'm 17 years old. I'll use my life. I'll get a bit of 10 pounds, 5 pounds, anything I can get, and I will go and get some food. He says, I hate that I have to do that, but that's what I have to do. Anyway, the session went on, I captured everything they said, was writing like crazy, taking it all in, and I said goodbye to them, they all went, and I turn around, and I see Ashley's waiting there, right? This 17-year-old guy. And he said to me, Melody, um, you know, and he was like a bit like unsure about asking, he was like, you know all those youth initiatives you said, and you know, the community things that you talked about? He says, how can I get involved and give something back? And I thought to myself, here is someone who doesn't have family, a roof over his head, no food to eat, asking me how we can give something back. And that moment for me, the humbling moment of thinking, that's why we do what we do. That's, that's why. And if someone like that in that situation can want to give something back, then we should all be doing more than our share to care about people. And this isn't just a business thing. This is a humanity thing. This is a day-to-day -day thing. This is seeing people who are, you know, who are less important, uh, you know, and seeing people, you know, really engaging with people. What you said about, you know, giving eye contact. So that moment for me was a really important moment. And actually, just to finish the part of the story, he, I did get, in, get him in touch with UK Youth Parliament and he got along and he went in, uh, got involved in that. So that was, so that was good. Yeah, thank you. Anything else anybody wants to say or share? Yes? Well, a bit on, on the same lines, uh, I would be interested to hear about your, your views. Uh. This is an extremely difficult question to answer, and one which I don't think can be answered from a different country. I think each country needs to find their own model because um, you know every country is different. So the models that would be used in the UK for engaging people in dialogue about how we go forward and address things will be different to this country. And I think the one size fits all thing doesn't work. But I think the most important thing is um, representation, first of all, you know, any kind of dialogue and people sitting around the table, and we talked about this, you said that point about the people in Parliament, you know, has to be represented and fairly representative of the people who, who it impacts. That's the first thing. Second of all, you know, um, how can we engage people? The dialogue thing that you said is the most important thing. I think sometimes people get into solutions very quickly. It's like, let's sit around the table, let's think of a solution. But the dialogue is the important thing. Um, but it's very difficult to achieve. And I think through a representative model, through a model that it is intergenerational and that is representative of different pockets of society. But the thing is, people talk about um, immigrants, for example, on the immigration issue, you know, that's a crisis facing. People talk about, oh, you know, immigrants, refugees, like perhaps less so in this country, but to some extent in the UK, I've heard conversations that as if they are like this nameless and faceless, you know, part of society. And then you ask people, how many of you have actually been and spoken to? And very few have, you know, so I think it's like we got to base our solutions on actual needs rather than presumed needs. I will be here, I will be hanging around, so if anybody does want to have a conversation or you're interested in us engaging with you, I'd love to have that. But I just want to say thank you so, so much for having me, and it's been such a pleasure being here. Thank you.